Hello, welcome to Goldmark Gallery here in Uppingham and to this new show of the work of Robert Dawson. Robert Dawson and his wife Peggy visited back in the early 90s and they came uh, not terribly regularly, maybe two or three times a year. And the strange thing is that the number I've seen coming in through the doors, having, having been here for 40 plus years, is, is vast. And many of them I remember. Quite often it's when they return that they're back in my mind and uh, I can remember about them. But Robert Dawson stuck in my memory. He came in as a customer and big man, big presence with his much smaller wife, Peggy. Sort of man who really filled the space, but he was a gentleman. He was both a gentleman and a gentleman. And I was, I was very moved by him, and I'm not exactly sure why. He had a very good eye for painting, and um, he bought some lovely things from us. And we chatted. Uh, and I found out that um, he was a, a teacher at a primary school, and that he had been a jazz saxophonist, and his wife, Peggy, who always came with him, had been the singer in the band. And then 1997, and they stopped coming. And I sort of vaguely wondered, as I, as I do, why and what had happened to them. But two years elapsed. And the next visit was Peggy on her own. And Peggy said to me that he, Robert had died. He died in 97. And it had taken her two years to compose herself and pluck up the courage to, to come in and, and tell me. And she had something else to tell me. I mean, what she told me was that Robert all his life had painted and that every time they had come here during the 90s, by the time they'd got to within two or three miles of the gallery from um, Nottingham where they lived, she had said to Robert, please tell him you're a painter. Tell him you're an artist. And he never had. And she had come to tell me this. And would I care to go to the house and have a look because it was full of paintings. Indeed I did. And I was mind blown by what I found. There was scores and scores of wonderful paintings, oil paintings and watercolors and drawings and woodcuts. I showed Brigby Graham, who we were then working with, and we got ready to have a, a show. And I had absolutely no hesitation. And the first show was called Mainly Wales, um, which is where Dawson did most of his painting. And I found quite quickly that one of the biggest fans of Robert Dawson was the great Cuffin Williams. We then made a, a film about Robert Dawson and great contributions by Cuffin Williams. Robert had also been interested in, particularly interested in artists, big name artists and their houses. And he had left drawings and writing about artists. And we published the book Painters and Their Houses in 2007, putting together um, from the drawings and paintings and writing that uh, 
uh, Robert had left. Also found out at that time that Robert also wrote poetry and so he was a poet and he was a musician and he was an, an artist and he was a, a, a modest man. In 2018, we published a book on Dawson written by our friend David Whiting. There was also at that time a special edition, special hardback edition, which we made. With the special of the book, you also get this folder comes and there's a copy of the film that we made with Cuff and Williams. Um, and this is music written and composed and played by Robert Dawson. And then in here as well, you get an original sketch. And you get some etchings by Dawson. So it's a great package. During the last 20 years, we've put on a number of Robert Dawson shows and his work has been added to many really great UK collections and it's, it's always a, a, a great sign when we see that. Having acquired the estate, we're now able to show you some drawings, watercolours, gouaches and one or two oils which have actually never been seen before. And looking at them on the walls in the gallery now, um, I'm yet again um, astounded at the strength of what Robert did. There's a phenomenal integrity in terms of the way in which he looked at the, at the landscape and a tremendous energy. His house was jam-packed with art books and although uh, he wasn't trained, and I find this terribly difficult to believe, um, he must have looked long and long and hard at what the great masters had been doing and learned a huge amount from, from them. So you can view the exhibition online, you can look through the catalogue, or if you can, it will be lovely to see you here in the gallery and look forward to many of you visiting. The early dun-coloured sun decants like weak tea through my window. Outside, all is love, like a Madonna's smile. Reality dissolving, slow images resolving on our own bed of pain. All of us, our hopes and fears, are born again. He wanted to be a painter, a poet, and a musician. And I think he achieved all those. We're going to grind to Miff's Cottage. And it's a lovely cottage, and we love going there. And it's a lovely drive up. And when Llewellyn was here, Bob used to sometimes walk up to get the cattle out of the way so we could get through. Oh, it's just quite a tricky drive. All these sharp bends and rocks sticking out. 
And here we are, grey. How about that? We used to stay at my Van Wee Kitchen's cottage, which was lovely. And uh, Bob did a lot of painting round there at Dolgestlai and all round that area. A Cadaridris. But uh, Bob always painted, no matter where he was. He just couldn't stop. It was something he did, non-stop. There was always a, a pad in the car. He kept a pad in the car that he used. And uh, sketch all day long. And when we got home at night, while I was getting a meal, he would be making them into watercolours. He just did it, non-stop. He could not stop. <laughs> He was a natural painter, he was a born painter. There was nothing which he had been taught. I think that was it mostly. He had a very good sense of tone and colour and he obviously loved his subject matter. Bob did win a scholarship to the Stoke-on-Trent College of Art but as he was a sickly child, his mother thought he might be sick on the bus, even though he was about 17 at the time, so he didn't go. He said, to quote his own words, if he had gone, he would probably have wound up working in one of the pottery factories, painting roses on chamber pots. So he, he thought perhaps he'd done the best thing. <laughs> the main thing about his work was that he he really did love the world around him. He loved the sky and he loved the sea and he loved the cottages and he loved the slate fences. And that was dominant. That is totally different to what goes on today. Because in the past, the subject very much dominated the picture. And Bob was a man who loved the subject. And he put it down with tremendous humility. And I don't think he was ever really very really pleased with what he painted. I have a feeling he painted it, he had to get it off his mind, but he didn't say, that's jolly good, I like that. He wasn't that sort of person. He was uh, a painter of great sensitivity, although his physical onslaught of paint onto the canvas was pretty vigorous, but there was a great sensitivity within that. And I think a lot of his pictures uh, when you actually view the site, are a distillation, rather like Cezanne, of what uh, one actually sees. When he was a boy, his father was a postman and used to take him out on his van. And he used to love the scenery. And he used to go out all weathers. And the scenery in Staffordshire was very, very grand and very dramatic. It was wonderful. He loved it. Godlike and slow I move among my paints. The shapes with which I lately strove mock me from the canvas. A serenity to match the mood of nature's theme evades my colour. Such unholiness of form, violent perplexity of hue, bespeak of barrenness within. The soul too, you see, has its October days. His pictures are sensuous. They're romantic. He loves dark skies and shots of bright light and things. They're very much part of him, I think. Uh, certainly the handling of the paint, I'm sure. He, he, he being a generous person, he did use rich paint. He loved the quality of rich paint. It's a very interesting thing, I think, about the quality of paint. You can usually tell the character of an artist by his paint. He would take unusual grounds to the painting and try things which 
suddenly brilliant purples beneath slate quarry paintings, which actually were almost monochromatic when he finished them. But if you looked very carefully, and you can see it on this one, if you come just into this piece, there's quite a strong red in between the greys, and that's the underpainting. The underpainting occurs and occasionally shows through between slabs of paint, and that's very much a bob tray. If you were out to forge a Bob Dawson, you'd need to understand the underpainting that went on. And the underpainting, even in these earlier pictures, which appear quite dark, uh, have very brilliant colours beneath them. The colour was always good. I don't think you could ever fail his colour. When you went to a room and there was a painting by Bob, the first thing you would not say is what lovely colour. His colour was right. He had uh, a natural sense of tone and of colour and of drawing. And those are the things which made his work so good, both in his sketches, his watercolour, and in his oil painting. Well, this particular painting is uh, at Laskedge, which is in the Cheshire-Staffordshire borders, and it's a high edge of rock um, with large protrusions of rock through it. It was an area which Bob thought was almost Welsh in its qualities. And it's an area which has tremendous uh, weather changes, and this drama of, of the weather is very typical. And anyone who lives or knows this area would say, yes, yeah, that's the sky at Lask Edge. And throughout the area, there are stone walls. And this is a, uh, an area which other painters like Jack Simcock, Arthur Berry, and other Staffordshire artists painted. Uh, this area um, is always uh, a dramatic skyscape. And the optimism in these later paintings, and, and you can usually tell when Bob has moved on a little bit, because the signature, this one is the midstream signature, which has the full name in red. And then as we go from this period to a more optimistic period, it becomes RD and a strong, bright accent within pictures with jewel-like qualities of colour. It'd find a window or a doorway and put a jewel-like colour in these cerulean blues and brilliant cabals. As soon as he found the elements in a landscape, these hard, strong shapes of cottages, uh, he was happy. And so I think once he went to Wales, um, that, that gave him great pleasure. You know, the, the slate uh, walls, uh, a very uncompromising landscape. He seemed to be attracted to landscapes required great human um, ingenuity to survive in. I think it was a certain simplicity about Wales. The Welsh cottage was not something which showed off. He never showed off. And I think he liked things which were absolutely basic and natural. And all the little lanes he painted and roads and stone walls and things, they were all created naturally, not for effect. He loved the grandeur of it, I suppose. He loved the, the colours. He, he painted in quite a limited palette at times. He loved them. He lo just loved the, the scenery. It wasn't unlike Staffordshire, really. This painting um, has this brilliant glow within it and uh, aspects of paint which, out of context, look strange, but once they're placed within, the warm glow is to the activity, the cattle, warmth, the farmhouse, and he's very subtle in linking a colour here, the farm door, relates, and his paintings very often have complex relationships between one area and another, which to the casual observer are not always obvious. Bob was not an obvious painter. 
He painted strong subject matter, but with lots of subtle and uh, interesting nuances. He would keep a little sketchbook in the car and it was full of figures and boys on bicycles and ladies with shopping bags and anything that happened to go by. He did like drawing figures but they didn't seem to fit in with his landscapes. Bob liked painting cows because they did things with their bodies. Funny things. They twist their bodies. If you watch cows, you'll see they're doing weird things. He didn't like sheep because they were just bundles of fur. It always reminded me of one of the Holbein's portraits of one of the Tudor kings. He had that sort of build and uh, that kind of a face. He was a big man. He seemed to fill the landscape. Whenever you talk to him, he took up a great deal of space. Physically, he was a huge man. He could have been a prop forward in, in a rugby team. Big and tall and lovely. <laughs> no, he wasn't what you'd call the handsome hero. No, he wasn't. But he was a lovely man. Oh, this is interesting. Became professional saxophone player in the years of the big bands. Remember the big bands and use the itinerant nature of the living to give myself a good art education. So th this is how Bob really sums himself up, this, the whole life history there in about three inches. I suppose the first time I met Bob there was this uh, genial character with a alto saxophone and a, in one hand and a canvas in the other, so I thought we're fellow spirits. I first met Bob when I joined the Leslie Douglas Orchestra. We were going to Germany, but first we did a BBC audition and Bob always seemed to be there, near me. <laughs> if somebody took my coat, it was Bob. <laughs> and, uh, well, when you go to Germany, uh, you, if you take the fare of somebody else and you've got a car, that covers the expense of the car. So, Bob was going to take the tenor player with him, but the tenor player let him down. So he asked me if I would like to go with him. So, I travelled to Germany in Bob's old Volkswagen. We just worked in the same band and we found we could talk to each other. We were two lonely people really, but hadn't found anybody before that we could talk to and share things. So that's how we met. Then we thought, it would be nice if we got married. So we went to Frankfurt and the British Consul married us. So that's how it all started. <laughs> Exactly every artist I've ever known, proper artist, were interested in music and played some instrument. This very big man, he was a big man, and the saxophone, uh, as well as a sort of humorous sort of vision. His improvisation was great. He was connected to the original theme. It was an, emb an embellishment of the theme. And it never wandered too far away. You could always hear the theme behind it. But it was the improviser was fresh, interesting, adventurous. Bob picked up this saxophone that he'd never seen in his life before and played. And then I realized what a musician he was because he was playing this instrument and it was in a different sort of category. Bob was being one of the best lead altos on the dance band scene, the big band scene. And that is the highest compliment in a sense. You can play any saxophone player to be a good player and lead a section. <laughs> that was me. I've got a photo here, uh, I'm hidden behind Ken Griffiths, the band leader, but Bob is visible, <laughs> so that's all that matters. There's Bob. Have you got him? Bob and I were keen on the new musical, Bob, and uh, Bob used to get an American magazine called Downbeat. It came across an advertisement in there, wanted any records by Louis Armstrong, willing to swap. We can get plenty of Louis Armstrong in England. 
We used to send them over there and we got these rarities, all sorts of conditions and recordings of Charlie Parker. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <coughs> and um, we used to, well, Bob, this is, this is the sort of musician he was, he used to take down from the record the, the tunes. And uh, the, if anybody knows Parker, some of the tunes are not very easy. Play them well. We both played them, but uh, the solos Bob played were better than mine, and they were in the Bop idiom, which in that they you hadn't know, heard of it in, in the pastures. <laughs> so these two hicks from the sticks in Leek were playing music, which was, which was current in America at the time. I was very surprised when he gave up music, actually. To this day, I don't know really why. It's perhaps looking ahead, but I know he um, liked children. But I definitely thought it was a, 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 nearly a sin that he didn't continue with his music. It, it always made me sad. Bob gave up music because of the sort of music was being played. Uh, well, I don't know what they called it then, the sort of things, the Beatles and all that. He said it was like playing Morse code. He was lead alto in a sax section. He liked to play music. He didn't like to play pop stuff. That wasn't his thing. But he always wanted to be a teacher. And then I heard that uh, somewhere on the radio that uh, they were recruiting older people as teachers. So I told him about it and so he applied and he was taken on. So he became a teacher. Bob's classrooms. It was just like opening a gate into a beautiful garden. The walls were plastered with fresh, childlike things, you know, just done with great enthusiasm. And there we are, as a, a big child teaching a lot of little children, and they're all jointly involved in this. I would have thought it must have been a wonderful, it's like an experiment, you know, an adventure. He loved giving. He loved the children and he knew, he knew what, what he was there for, was to help the children, but he could discipline them as well. And his painting, well, he just went into his garret when he came home and he'd get, he'd get on with his painting when Peggy was making the dinner. And uh, I went to his, his, garret, his stu studio, I mustn't call it a garret, but it was crammed full of paintings, hundreds, hundreds of paintings. And it was a place where he could just be himself, let himself go, it didn't matter, it didn't, it didn't have to be tidy. Uh, paintings were strewn around on the tabletops. Uh, he had boxes, boxes and boxes of pictures, drawings. His brushes were all around, a smell of turpentine paintings stacked up against the wall. It was just a lovely hideaway. And he used to go there every night after school, straight up there. And then Peggy would call him down for his dinner when it was ready. When you give up teaching, invariably, artists blossom when they give up teaching. I've known artists in Wales who have done that. They've been teaching six days, or five days a week and they stopped them painting. As soon as they retired, their work has improved immensely. Pastel colours were creeping in and the, 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 the dark blackness was disappearing. And I think this was probably because he'd, um, he'd been able to retire and uh, he didn't have the stresses and strains of teaching, which, which was a great strain, uh, especially on a sensitive artist. I often wonder how the hell Bob coped. But again, we come back to Peggy and she understood and kept him going a bit longer. If anybody uh, wanted to exhibit his work, he'd say, I haven't got anything. But he had, he'd got hundreds of beautiful paintings. He just didn't like, I suppose, exposing himself to people like that. He was just, just being an artist, I suppose, being a sensitive man. I think that we, we've 
suffered from an age of self-publicists and those who depend on Saatchi and Saatchi for their image rather than their content, that we've rather been led by the nose into believing certain things are good. And the paintings, I think, will in reverse. Those which are now heavily publicised will fade, and those which are not will increase in value. A lot of the art critics, myself included, I wrote for The Guardian for over 12 years, we only wrote about modern art. And the artists who were carrying on in what was then considered the traditional way were not exactly forgotten, but purposely overlooked. He's the last person to go around saying what a good artist I am. And he never aimed high. His aim was to paint good pictures. He wasn't, he wasn't ambitious in any way, except ambitious to paint better. And, and uh, he's one of those people who today, I'm afraid, are rather rare, these painter lovers of the world around them, because um, the students in art schools, they're not taught to love anything, they're not taught to draw, and the only way to show your love of something is to put it down. If you can't draw, it must be very frustrating. It means really, basically, you don't love anything. And they're not encouraged to look around, use their eyes and love things. Today, it all has to come from inside the head, new ideas and things like that. Bob was perfectly content just to paint the world around him. He really did love the world. It was a sort of religion, I think. And I, it's wonderful for me that he loved Wales so much because we have the, had the benefit of his pictures. He loved skies. If he saw a lovely sky, he'd, he'd say, nice one, God, thank you, God, and throw his arms in the air and dance. He was a big man, but he danced. <laughs> it was lovely to watch. Bob's quality of work and the manner in which he painted and technically how he painted if untrained he be, which I don't believe, Bob always worked with very sound methodology and his paintings will remain and they will be uh, unchanging because the pigments he used and the way he placed them on and the, the grounds that he included and spent a lot of time preparing well, I think stand these in very good stead in time to come. He had many ways of doing pictures. They could be delicate. He did a lot of work with uh, tissue paper and collage. He would do watercolours. Uh, he did pen and ink drawing. And he did big, bold paintings with oils and a palette knife. He varied a lot. It was just, I suppose, the mood he, how he saw the thing he wanted to do. As I say, it's like taking a chorus on something. You hear the tune and you think how you can interpret it. And that's how he did his painting. You're just too marvellous, too marvellous for words like glorious, glamorous, and that old standby amorous. It's all too wonderful, I'll never find the words that say enough, tell enough, I mean they're just not swell enough, you're much too much and just too very, very to ever be in Webster's Dictionary. And so I'm borrowing a love song from the birds to tell them that you're marvelous, too marvelous for words. In case all the power and the painful warning leave me again, I must paint quickly. Much I have to do now, the trick is mine. All those years to clear off all those broken images and dirty colour I was using to show the world how beautiful I thought it was. Maudlin, eager, drunk as I was on you, loved you better than a mother. 
I see you now for real, and full my brush can register at last. Oh.